If you would take your Bible and turn with me to Joshua in chapter 23. Joshua in chapter 23. Am I a little loud? Maybe. Well, you always say I'm too loud. All right. We made some adjustments back there. Joshua in chapter 23, we're going to read the entire chapter. There's not but 16 verses there. But uh, it says in verse 1, and it came to pass a long time after the the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. And Joshua called for all Israel and for for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age and... You have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan. With all the nations that I have cut off, even unto the great sea westward. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight. And ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. Be therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to, to the right hand or to the left, that ye come, uh, come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of their name of their gods nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them nor bow yourselves unto them. But cleave unto the Lord your God as ye have done unto this day. For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong, but as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God, else if ye do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. But they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given unto you. And behold this day I am going the way of all the earth and you know in all your hearts and in your, all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. Therefore it shall come to pass that, all, that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things until he have destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. Let's bow our heads once again in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we are thankful that you fulfill your promises, Lord, but we understand that you expect obedience on our part. Lord, we pray this morning, as we go into your word, that you would open our ears and our eyes and our hearts, that we would have understanding. Lord, once again, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, and for his willingness to go to the cross and die there, Lord, that we might have everlasting life. For all who place their faith and trust, who confess and repent of their sins, Lord, to have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. So, Lord, we pray once again this morning that your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. We find in these passages ultimately that Joshua has been proactive in allotting the remaining or the remnant of the land to the tribes of those nations that remained based upon the promise of or the promises of God. And all through this chapter, we find three different references that Joshua makes to the promise or the promises of God. We find in verse 5 uh, in chapter, chapter 23, it says this in the last part of that verse, as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. Once again, we find in verse 10, 
it says towards the close of that verse, as he hath promised unto you. And then we find again in verse 15, towards the midway point of that verse, which the Lord your God promised you. Folks, the book of Joshua is all about the promises of God. It's all about God's faithfulness to you, to the nation of Israel, but ultimately to you. We look back at the Old Testament. We see God fulfilling his will and his word and his way. But all along the way, God has made promises to his people if they will obey, if they will continue to follow his statutes, his law, his word. And I want to look this morning at the 23rd chapter of Joshua. And we see Joshua's farewell address. And there are three phrases in there. And I, I took my new King James Version this week as we uh, went on vacation. And I was studying the new King James Version this week. So I may use some words that you might not find in your King James Version or in, in whatever translation. But I'm going to refer to those, to those words as well. But first of all, Joshua says, he says, you have seen, look with me in verse 3, he says, and ye, in the King James English, have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. You have seen. Joshua is calling the nation of Israel to look back at all the promises that God has been able to fulfill or that he has fulfilled according as he had made to the children of Israel. Christian today, let me tell you something. You can look back, and it's easy now as I've grown older. And uh, some of you have made the comment this morning about my little chin hair here. Sue says, I like it. I kind of trimmed it up this morning. I got to look, and I didn't realize that there's as much the King James English uses hoary hair. Old gray hair coming in. But as I grow older, I can look back and I can see now the hand of God in my life and on my life as I was growing up and the mistakes that I made, but God's still fulfilling his promises. And I can look back and I can see the faithfulness of God. Every time he delivered me, I don't know why he did. I've often questioned why did God choose to take an old South Arkansas country boy like me and bring me to where I'm at today. Christian, you can look back in your life at the times that you have failed God, but yet he has remained faithful to you, which has led you to repent. He's convicted you of your sins, and that's what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. When we fall into sin or when we are snared or we're tempted and we trip, Baptists like to call that backsliding. Just to be frank, we ought not like to call it anything except sin. But the Holy Spirit has drawn you back to a right relationship and a right walk and a right step with the Lord your God. And you can look back in, in spite of your shortcomings, God has brought you through. I want to tell you something, folks. In my younger days, I'm not going to confess my sins to you. I've already confessed them to the Lord. If God had not been faithful, if God had not had a plan, if his will wasn't being carried out, I wouldn't be here today. But I can look back and I can see where the hand of God was upon me. And Joshua tells the children of Israel, you have seen all God has done for you. He's done this for you. Friend, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let me tell you what God did on your behalf. He sent his blessed son, his righteous son. He left his heavenly home, his throne of glory. And he came to this earth and he willingly sacrificed himself upon the cross. He willingly died in your place. When you and I deserve death, Jesus took our place. He was nailed to that cross, and he died. When the scripture tells us, Jesus cried out, it is finished. One of the gospels says that 
records his last words as, It is finished. Jesus finished the redemptive work, the shedding of blood, which was necessary for the payment for your sin. But he didn't leave it there. He was buried in a tomb. And on the third day, the Bible records one of the Gospels, an angel rolled the stone away, another Gospel that there was a great earthquake. And those guards who were standing outside the tomb became his dead men. Remember, they'd placed him, placed him there to make certain that no one stole the body of Jesus away because they had heard him say, destroy this temple and on the third day I will raise it again. God did that for you. For the nation of Israel, he, Joshua told him, said, he has fought for you. He has fought for you. You have seen all that God has done. You have seen all that God has promised. You see, the nation of Israel, their job wasn't finished. I mentioned earlier in the introductory statements that Joshua had been proactive in going, going out and going ahead and doling out the remaining parts of the land. Even though there were still enemies in the land, those who were in opposition to the God of Israel... Joshua went ahead and doled it out and told the tr different tribes that were going to go and inhabit that land that, listen, God's already given this to you. He's going to go before you. He's going to expel them. He's going to drive them out. One of you shall chase a thousand, and they'll flee from you. God would deliver, but it was necessary for them to possess it. Joshua reminds them of everything that God had brought them through. He said, you've seen. <laughs> now go. <laughs> now go. Now go. Secondly, I want to point to verse 6 where it says this, and we find several therefores throughout this scripture passage, and, and I heard an old preacher say one time, actually I've heard several old preachers, of which I'm becoming an old preacher now, Brother Don, I, I, I heard your statement last week that uh, you have perfected old age. Yeah. I haven't perfected it yet, but I'm getting there. There are several therefores in there, and I've heard an old preacher say one time, when there's a therefore, you need to understand, and you need to read, and you need to study, and see what it's there for. In verse 6, it says, the King James English, Be ye therefore, be ye therefore. Joshua had reminded the nation of Israel, you have seen all that God has done for you. You have seen God fighting for you. You have seen God deliver you. You have seen God drive the men out from before you therefore that's a conjunctive word it means that you look at the previous events that have taken place and then there's going to be a profound statement that follows and directs and guides your path Joshua said you have seen therefore be very courageous isn't it amazing how the book of Joshua begins with the words of God? Be strong and very courageous. Be strong and courageous, Joshua. Joshua reminds the nation of Israel. Be strong and very courageous. Joshua is about to go the way of the earth, as the King James English shows it. And we understand, as we read a little further in chapter 24, Joshua lived to be 110 years old. And the, the, the end of the book of Joshua, we find three significant burials. And I'm not going to get into those. I'm saving those for next week for those of you that are got one foot on a banana peel and the other foot in a grave. Joshua says, you have seen, therefore, be very courageous. Be very courageous to keep. What were they to keep? And this is speaking to the, the obedience that God expects from his people. 
Be therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. You see, God has expectations that he places upon his children. Anybody ever have children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews and not expect them to do anything? I mean, we look at the generation coming up now, and it appears that way. <laughs> but I know that in this congregation, I can with certainty and surety say that when you had children, when you had little babies, and they're so cute, aren't they? I used to think they were innocent, but they're not. I'm not going to use the terminology I used the Sunday before last. But I'll say this. You didn't expect that baby to not be potty trained at some point in time, correct? We all tried to teach our, our children to potty train. We, we call it potty training because we knew we knew that as they grew into adults, it was going to be kind of odd to have to go in there and change their diapers. Am I correct? And so we trained them. And when they had an accident or they made a mistake, what did we do? We corrected them. We punished them. Because we didn't want them doing that all their life. And then as they grew older and they were potty trained, we began to teach them to brush their teeth and choose their clothes and get dressed to prepare, prepare for the day. And as they grew older and they entered into the education system, whether it be home school or the public school system, we expected them to study and to read and to do their homework so that they might understand how to survive and how to make their way in this world. And as they grew into teenagers... I don't know about you, but I expected my kids to get out and get a job. To dip their toe into the world of life. So they entered into high school and out of high school, some choose to go to college. Some choose to go out and to get a real job. Some choose to go out and purchase their own home or some choose to go out and rent an apartment, but we expect them to progress. You see, life is a progression. The Christian life is a progression also. And let me tell you this. From the point of conversion, God doesn't expect you to remain a babe. He expects you to grow into maturity in your walk with the Lord. And in that process of becoming more like Christ, Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Or to become more and more like him, Paul said, I press toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We're to progress forward. And the only way that we progress forward is to follow the laws and the statutes and the word of God. We look back. <laughs> He says, you have seen, therefore, work forward. The middle part of verse 6, it says that you turn not aside, King James English, that you turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left. Those words that you turn not in the new King James Version, they insert the word lest, lest. And that word lest, it implies that there's a possible negative outcome. There's a possible and a likely negative outcome. Now, if you were to go back and you were to look at the original Hebrew, the original Hebrew would read something like this. Sir, built sir, men, y'all mean some old. Now, that doesn't impress you. It doesn't impress me. I have no clue what it means other than to go back and look at the English translation. But if you take it from the proper Hebrew, 
It literally means this. Turn, not turn, from right, left. What is the implication there for the Christian, for the person who's made their profession of faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? The same, it has the same implication it does for the nation of Israel that Joshua is instructing here. It means stay on the straight path. Walk the narrow way. Little story from this week of vacation. We'd been up the mountain to, as, to the furthest point that we could go because the snow had gotten pretty deep. We'd hit some drifts and we turned around coming back down the mountain and we encountered these two young men from just outside of Amarillo, Texas. I don't remember what was the name of the town they were from. Y'all remember? Morgan or something like that. These men had been going on the other side of the valley from us, and they had seen us go up the mountain in our side by side. And they decided that it must be okay to drive a vehicle up there, a regular street vehicle. We'd been up the mountain, and we'd come to the stopping point, which we could go no further. We'd turn around, and we'd come back out, and we found a, a eating place there on the side of the mountain on the rocks in, while the, where the sun was shining, where the wind was not quite as bad. We'd stopped, and we'd eat, and we'd fellowshiped, and we'd fed the birds. We got back in our machines, and we began to come back down the mountain, and all of a sudden, we encounter these two young men in their four-wheel drive pickup. And they'd hit that deep snow that we had passed through. And they'd gotten in a snow drift and they'd slid off into the ditch. Thankfully, they'd slid off into that side and not the other side because it was a long ways down. We managed to get them out and back up in the roadway and they backed that truck all the way back down the mountain. The point in telling you that story is is that on either side of the roadway there were ditches that were unseen to the natural eye. They had been filled over with snow It looked like the road was broad and wide. But when they got themselves into a little bit of trouble, and they began to slip to the left and to the right, they soon found themselves stuck in the ditch. No longer being able to advance up that narrow path. As I said, the New King James Version inserts that word lest. To me, that's a warning. That's a warning. Joshua said, be therefore very courageous. New King James English, lest. (laughs) Be very courageous to keep and to do. In other words, Live your lifestyle concurrent with the Word of God. Caution the word lest. You slip into the ditch. (laughs) Lest you get stuck. Lest you, you get bogged down. Lest you, in the King James English, you stray. Stay on that straight and narrow way. Keep going forward in the progression toward Christ likeness. For the hope of eternal life through your heavenly, to your heavenly home. Turn not turn from right, left. Thirdly, we find Joshua 
instructing the children of Israel to be alert and to be aware. Look with me in verse 7. That you come not among these nations. These that remain among you neither make mention of the name of their gods nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them nor bow yourselves unto them, but cleave unto the Lord. What's Joshua telling the nation of Israel? He's telling them, listen, don't intermingle. Don't intermingle. Paul encouraged, ladies, Paul encouraged, young men, Paul encouraged believers not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We're living in a day in which I think Brother Don mentioned this last week in which the church should be influencing the world but we're living in a day in which the world is influencing the church I mean it's evident we're we're seeing attendance decline we're seeing programs increase all in an effort to draw people back into the church where we're coming we got to set up coffee shops and throw parties don't talk about sin that's too offensive rather than the church maintaining its pathway towards righteousness and towards Christ-likeness and towards its heavenly home. We've allowed the intermingling of this godless society and culture to creep in. And it didn't happen overnight. It was just a little bit at a time. And the scripture says that a little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. John MacArthur says in his study notes, he says the dangers of being incomplete about possessing the land included that of intermingling with the godless. In Exodus in chapter 23, in verse 32, prior to their exodus, or actually <coughs> God's giving instructions to Moses, by the time they get to chapter 23 of Exodus, they've already left Egypt. God's telling them all about the promised land. He's telling them about the people that live there. He says in verse 32, Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. Friends, let me tell you something. You know, I've heard, had preacher, pastor friends across this state and a couple of other different states where I know pastors wanting people in the church to pray for revival. Pray for revival. We need to be praying for a spiritual awakening within the New Testament church. We need to be praying for revival to take place. But let me tell you something. At some point in time, we miss the concept of revival and it being about change in us. Revivals came to mean we were to have a pack a pew night. It's to mean we were to have hamburger cookouts and youth rallies, fellowships. Revival came to mean, well, we were supposed to bring a lost friend. But let me tell you what revival, in essence, really means. It means the church getting their hearts and lives right with God. Allowing God to pull them out of that ditch and getting them back on that straight and narrow way that leads 
to everlasting life. It means that we're to cleave at verse Cleave unto the Lord your God, verse 8, as he have done unto this day. You've seen. You've seen God's promises fulfilled. You've seen God's faithfulness unfold. You've seen God fighting for you. It's time for you to be very courageous. It's time for the church to keep and to do the word of God. It's time for Christians to be like Christ. Get out of that ditch of despair. It's time not to allow the world the opportunity. But we're to cleave. Verse 8. Here's some words here. But. Here's another, another one of those connective words. But. You know, we find the word but in several different passages throughout the Scripture. God uses that word but here as a connective word. It's implying that there's something else that's taking place, but something else is about to happen. We find instances in the Scripture where it talks about the sinfulness of the way that we once were. And then we find the words, but God. <laughs> God seeing us as we were in our sin and death. Where we were dead in sin. But God made a way to bring us to the point where we were dead to sin. Where we were doomed to eternal fire and judgment. But God made a way that we might have a life everlasting here the implication is you've seen everything that God has done for you you've seen the promises of God fulfilled therefore be very courageous so that or lest in the King James English or turn you not or that you not that you turn not in the King James so you don't stray, be alert, be aware, don't allow the world to come and intermingle, don't call unrighteousness righteousness, don't call sin and darkness light, but cleave unto God. we read the remainder of that chapter we find another therefore and to me it's kind of amazing that this last therefore that we find in chapter 23 is also connected to the promise of God we find a therefore in verse 11 take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. What the scripture is telling us, hold fast, stand strong, remain faithful. Therefore, love God. Or else... Or else. Verse 12 and 13. We find those warnings, or that warning. Or else, if you don't, you know, there's always consequences to choices. That's what we tried to teach our children as we were training them up. You dirty your diaper, you get corrected. You don't obey your parents commands you get corrected you don't study your do your homework you get corrected now as I said the world today is getting away from that 
We don't need to allow that, that type of doctrine and teaching to infiltrate the church. I'm afraid it already has in many instances. Joshua tells the children of Israel, you stay firm, you stay strong, you hold on to the Lord, maintain that path, follow those steps, or else, what happens? God will no longer drive them out from before you. God will no longer allow you to experience the victories, but suffer defeat. And these people that you allow to remain, these people that you intermingle with, they'll be snares, they'll be traps, they'll be whips, and they'll be thorns to you. You know, I'm convinced that today there are many, many churches closing their doors for various reasons. Many Christians that are staying home. Many professing Christians they've fallen into these snares and these traps and they've slipped into the ditch they get on their little pity parties and they cry oh why me Joshua remains he reminds the children of Israel that they had served God all this time up until now He's saying, don't quit now. Don't stop now. And we learned that the nation of Israel would remain faithful to the work and to the word of the Lord until that generation died off. What does that tell us about the New Testament church today? We're raising an ignorant generation when it comes to the scripture and the word of God the purpose of the church and the worship of the Lord. But primarily for the church that's still here at this point in time. And you know, the church in some, in some form or fashion is going to be here until Jesus returns. He gave us that promise. The true church. But for the church today, it tells us or it gives us a call to remember. Remember, you've seen. God's given you. God's promises. Secondly, I believe for the church it's called to repeat. To repeat. What I mean by that is it's a call to repeat the stories of God's promises fulfilled and God's blessings poured out to the coming generations. There's an old hymn that we used to sing. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. Sweetest that ever was heard. Thirdly. For the church, it's a call to repentance. Church down through history has made many grave errors. For some, it's been errant preachers. For some, it's been errant doctrine. For some, it's been errant theology. For some, it's been errant practice, errant lives. For some, They've been left behind. For some, they've strayed into the ditch. For some, God has allowed them to suffer defeat. But for all, 
It's a call to repentance, which requires confession, admission of our failures and shortcomings to follow the straight and narrow way. Peter was actually a night this week, I know it's hard to imagine, but wasn't able to sleep and got up in the middle of the night and I was watching Dr. David Jeremiah. And he reminded his church of what Peter tells the church in Second Peter in chapter 3 of what we ought to be. Second Peter in chapter 3 in verse 10 through 14, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the earth elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be? in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening, hasting unto the coming of the day of the God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. In verse 13, he says, Nevertheless, we, speaking of believers, according to his promise, speaking of God, Look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. You've seen, according to his promises, we, that is Christians, look for new heavens and new earth. The one that's existing today, it's, it's going to burn up. It's going to melt away. It's going to be judged with righteous judgment. That new heavens and a new earth, that's the one that John spoke of, John the Revelator in the book of Revelations. That's what we're looking for. Remember that word but, that word therefore? Peter says, be diligent. Be diligent. Be diligent that when he comes, you may be found, <laughs> verse 14, of him. One of these days, God's going to come and find us whether we want him to or not. But that we might be found of him in peace, the peace that passes all understanding, without spot, because we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, blameless, because we're progressing forward in that Christian walk and becoming more and more in his likeness. Christian friend, where do you stand in your walk with the Lord? God's calling you to look back at the things, at the times, at the ways in which God has delivered you in those small victories. Because he promised. And one of these days we look forward to the big victory. The final enemy is defeated. We know that Christ has already accomplished that on our behalf. And then in the middle of our Christian life. 
We see that therefore. Because God saved your soul, therefore be very courageous to keep, to do, lest you stray. You turn to the left or to the right. Constantly be alert and be aware. Don't allow the world to influence you. Remember, repeat, and repent of what God has done and your shortcomings on behalf or in behalf of him. Look to his promise and be diligent. Remain faithful. Friend, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me, let me just say one thing real quickly. That fervent heat that melts this whole earth, that doesn't speak only to the Christian. Paul in 1 Thessalonians speaks of Christians in regards to being forever with the Lord. As we look to the end of the book, in the book of Revelation, John the Revelator records the words of Jesus Christ. God himself, God in the flesh, God incarnate. Throughout the visions that John has revealed to him as we come toward the end of Revelation, we find that day of judgment. You see, for those people who continue to live on this earth after Christ takes the church out after they begin their eternity with the Lord there is yet another eternity Christ tells the church remember tells the church to repeat he tells the church to repent But he tells the lost soul apart from Christ, judgment is coming. And by the way, that will be eternal also. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. But until that time, you have the opportunity as you respond to the drawing power of the Holy Spirit and preaching his word. call upon the name of the Lord, to confess your sin, to repent, and to be saved. God is speaking to your heart this morning when you respond according to his will. By the way, the Bible says that his will is that none should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. To his word, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart thou shalt be saved confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead will you do that this morning once again church is there something you need to get right before the Lord you can you can you can get it right right where you're standing you more than welcome to come up here to the chancel of the stage area But I want to encourage you to pray and to seek his face and to turn from your wicked ways and allow him to heal your land. (laughs) First Chronicles chapter 7. Let's stand together this morning. Will our music team come? Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the way of salvation that you provide. We thank you for the consistency of your message, for the straightness of your path. We thank you, Lord, that in spite of ourselves, you presented your son on Calvary's cross that we might be saved, that we might live each and every day to be more and more like him. 
Lord, once again this morning, we simply pray your will be done. Whatever decision you've laid upon people's hearts, let them be found obedient. Let, they be, let them be found of you in peace. <laughs> Lord, forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Will you come this morning? God's laid something upon your heart.